No working. Can you hear me? Yes. Good, Let, good. <laughs> well, thank you for joining this uh, the lunchtime session and the join the conversation incorporating breakthrough cervical cancer data into practice, sponsored by the CGEN and the GEMLOVE. Well, my name is Keiichi Fujiwara. I'm uh, the moderating this uh, the very interesting and important session. So I'm really honored to having the, the amazing faculties here. So would you like to introduce by yourselves? My pleasure. I'm Ketel Russo. I'm a GYM oncologist. Oh, I forgot to say the disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about this. So here you go. No. Yes, Please. I'm Keta Russo. I'm a GYM oncologist working at Catholic University of Rome, Policlinico Gemelli. Anna? Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna, as she said. <laughs> I'm a medical oncologist by training. I'm running the gynecological cancer program at Valdebron Institute of Oncology in Barcelona, Spain. Leslie? Hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Randall. I'm a GYM oncologist in the United States. I live near Washington, D.C., and I also work with the GOG Foundation as a cervical cancer lead. Good to see everyone. Thank you, and Brian. Hey, thank you very much. I'm Brian Slomovitz. I'm a gynecologic oncologist in Miami Beach, Florida, um, and I'm honored to be here, so thanks for having me. I look forward to our discussion. Okay, good. So, so these are the disclosures for all the faculties here. So the, the order of our conversation will start from the uh, first line and the, the well, front line t treatment yeah. and the new data. And then go, go to the, the second line, treatment changing, and then go to the um, case presentation by Brian. So shall we start? Oh, so, so the, this is the, the QR code that you can participate your, uh, yourself for the discussions. So I will remain showing this for a while. Okay. So let's uh, go to the uh, decoding the latest development in the locally advanced, the first line recurrent cervix cancer. So uh, as you know, the, um, the first topic will be presented by Keta. And uh, as you know, uh, the chemo radiation has been a the long time standard chemotherapy. And now we, are, we have the two very important uh, the data presented this year. So Keta will present this then. She will show, they present another uh, the important first line therapy um, evidences. Okay, so Kenna? Jill? Thank you so much. Yes, we are living an unprecedented moment in the treatment of cervical cancer, and in particular, uh, we are changing the standard of care in locally advanced disease, which was represented since uh, more than 25 years by the combination of uh, concurrent chemo radiation and brachytherapy. There were several data suggesting that when we combine immunotherapy to radiation treatment, we are able to enhance the efficacy of radiation. And we attempt to do it in color trial. Uh, Professor Monk uh, presented uh, this data la last year at IGCS uh, combining the durvalumab to concurrent chemo radiation in locally advanced high risk cervical cancer. And unfortunately, and really surprising for all the scientific community, the trial did not meet its primary endpoint. But at that time, we were already running the Keynote A18 using same population, higher risk patient, a different drug, because pembrolizumab was the drug we use in Keynote A18. The population probably <coughs> more risky, because we enrolled stage 1B2 to be node positive patient, where the definition of node positive was at least 1.5 centimeter in the minimum diameter. 
of lymph node and stage 3 and 4A regardless lymph nodal status. We stratify for the type of radiotherapy. We are strongly convinced that in this kind of trial, if you do not have a good radiotherapy, you cannot be confident on what is the added benefit of what you are adding stage and the dose of radiotherapy was a stratification factor. This is a trial for high-risk patient. Basically, less than 5% of patient had a CPS score negative tumor, less than one. It's a global trial. 30% of patient coming from Asia and 50% uh, of patient, white patient, uh, really a global trial. It enrolled in 176 centers in 30 countries. Uh, we put a lot of effort in that. And uh, really, high-risk patient, 56% uh, of them stage 3 and 4A. But I want to underline that stage 1B2 to B according to 2014 classification, actually are stage 3C. So I'm not confident in saying that stage 1B2 to B are less risky. These are the patients with positive lymph nodes. 85% of our patients had positive lymph nodes, 60% in pelvis, 30% also in the paraortic area. We provide a good quality of radiotherapy up to 90% of patients receive what is considered the standard radiotherapy, IMRT or VMAT, and the dose was uh, for more than 90% of patients, more than 70. And uh, the trial has uh, two primary endpoints. Uh, we presented the, the final results for PFS and the interim analysis results for overall survival. PFS is positive and clinically relevant with the 30% reduction in the risk of progression in patients treated with Pembro. The follow-up is 18 months right now. Overall survival is not yet mature, less than 43% of events, and not significant at this first interim analysis but a trend toward an increase in overall survival was reported with another ratio of 0.73, which is really supportive of PFS results. Can so, I, if I may? Sure. So I, I think it's very important, you know, in order, sorry for my voice, I miss it <laughs> in, the, in the aircraft. Um, <coughs> I think it's be, very important, you know, to, to, to transmit to the audience that longer follow-up is crucial when you want to analyze data with immunotherapy. And currently, the median mm -hmm. follow-up that we have for the keynote A18, it could, I mean, it could be defined as short. So with the tendency that we have already seen, we are very, I mean, we are very positive and we expect that this trend, this positive trend, will be really manifest with the longer follow-up. Mm -hmm. We, we are confident also, and the typical shape of immunotherapy curves is what we see here. When they start separating, they increase the separation over time. And I'm confident, this is why, this is the final PFS. We will re not allocate alpha in another PFS analysis, but we will have descriptive results to capture the benefit, the long-term benefit. And also, we are waiting for the overall survival exactly. events for the final overall survival analysis. Yeah. Also, because uh, all the subgroup, uh, we pre-specified the several subgroup, these are descriptive analysis, but there is a consistent benefit, uh, basically, in all the group. Uh, and I want to comment stage 1, B2, to B. The alteration is less than one, thus suggesting anyway a benefit. Probably we can discuss the magnitude of benefit. But again, these are descriptive analysis. And actually, we have only 25% of event in stage 1B, 2B. So I'm confident that with a larger maturity, as you suggest, Anna, this alteration may change. We will see in the second analysis. Can I interrupt there? Sure. Because I think that's really important. And the reason is, you know, I, I'm from the U.S. And in the U.S., 
the FDA has acted on forest plots. <laughs> they acted on a forest plot for Paola. Um, I, I think that to remember that these are not powered to be definitive um, outcomes. And, and it's important because we keep saying over and over that this was a higher risk population than Cala, which is very true. And when you look at this forest plot, you really think, okay, it's the, really the highest risk patients um, that benefit. So you could get into this sort of, um, you could falsely conclude that only those patients benefit. And so I think it's important to know that yeah. It's the whole population, right? The, exactly, because the primary point was the, the overall population. The trial was not powered to detect the difference according yeah. to the stage. And these analyses are descriptive. Mm -hmm. I mean, reflects the number of events that have been reported in the different stage. We will, uh, we will see what will be the FDA decision yeah, in exactly. January. But we need, to, I mean, we need to be aware about this comment because when you look at the keynote 820 c that we will review now, I mean, they approved Pembroke first line only for those who were CPS positive greater than one, exactly. based in a non-analytical subgroup for the CPS less than one. So. I think, although we understand that this is an intent to treat population that is a high risk population, and in this all group the trial is positive as scientific, mainly our colleague from the GOG and FDA representative should be aware of that and should fight against FDA for this subgroup analysis. They will fight for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, there is also another possibility. Look at what happened with the Ruby trial, for instance, and it may Mediate approval for the population in which there is a huge benefit and waiting for overall survival data for the other. I'm curious uh, to see what will be FDA, but also EMA indication. So you're hinting towards this, but in not just a high risk population, or what are other reasons why this is positive and Kayla is negative? Any other, is, I mean, is, could, it, could it be the agent? Could it be any other yeah. factors involved? I mean, you know, the, we've seen, we're seeing this data. We're seeing it twice today. today. We've seen it. Well, don't, and don't throw statistics out there. Come on, tell us what you're saying. Under your pressure this morning. <laughs> is, is it the investigator? Yours is positive and Brad is negative? Or? I think it's the investigator. I will not take this bad question. I will not take this bad question, but you know, PDL one in this trial is not predictive. I showed this data this morning, even though less than 5% of patients had PDL one negative tumor, it was really evident that also PDL1 negative patients get benefit from okay. Pembro. This is a different situation with what we have seen in the advanced disease. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, terms, uh, in terms of uh, toxicity, we were at the beginning, I have to confess, we were a little bit, uh, some concern that were in combining immunotherapy plus radiotherapy. But the toxicity profile that we registered during the trial is very, very reassuring. And uh, again, basically all patients completed the treatment, uh, and this does not impact on the quality of life of our patient, which is important. This is a potentially curative setting. The possibility to complete the treatment, uh, to give good radiotherapy, good treatment is important because here we are treating patients. And since the beginning, when we designed the trial, we accomplished it and we all agree on the idea that radiotherapy should be of high quality, should be the standard, not high quality. This is the standard radiotherapy. And our benchmark for radiotherapy, the benchmark of all radiation oncologists is the EMBRACE trial that suggests that the total cervical biological equivalent dose should be between 85 and 90, and we have 87. So we are confident that the quality of radiotherapy is good, and we are confident that really PEMBRO had. But this morning, and also at ESMO last week, we saw another interesting trial, completely different concept. Here we are talking between chemo, induction with chemo before chemo radiation. Completely different population. 
because 76% of patients in interlaced trial is a stage two, 10% stage one, so a low risk population. 60% of patients were not negative. And this is a, a UK-based trial. 76% of patients were enrolled in UK and 20% of patients in Mexico. My, it was a pity this morning I had not the opportunity to speak with Mary about radiotherapy because Interlace had the great merit to have a 10-year trial, so longer follow-up. As Anna reported, the, the follow-up is important. But in 10 years, the technique and quality of radiotherapy changed a lot. A lot. And, and unfortunately, IMRT, which is actually considered the standard, was uptake by only 40% of patients. And volumetric brachytherapy, which is the standard, was received only by 30% of patients. So the results are extremely interesting and always better to have two positive trial in a setting in which since 25 years, we did not get any advantage for our patient. But the we need more information. We will ask, we will have the possibility to speak. Can we go back? Can we just? I have a yeah. question. Yeah. Maybe Again. I, you, you told me before not to ask you questions on interlace, but I will anyway. This is supposed um, to be conversational, by the yeah, way. Yeah, we're supposed That's to have fun. That's why we're interrupting each other. So the difference between interlace and some of these other trials is, um, and we heard this when we left the room in Madrid, we were hearing the buzz, people could go home and do it on Monday. Exactly. Right, so we're not waiting for FDA approval. We're not waiting for anything. Exactly. So what I'm interested to hear actually from the, most of the panel here, Give me a reason why you would and a reason why you wouldn't. Or is there no reason? Because you know, when we talked about this earlier, like th there's reasons. Well, you, you know, it takes four weeks to get a patient to radiation. Give them chemotherapy. You're not doing any harm. No. But let's talk about this a little bit because it's important. You would because I, it's available, right? It's available but, today. Yeah. But it. I think, I mean, and it's, I mean, it's a little frustrating that it was kind of there on the shelf all this time. And for 20 years, we haven't made um, progress in this space and it was sitting there all along. But, I, I think that the quality of radiation has changed so much over time. And I, to me, this control arm doesn't perform, and I haven't you know, analyzed it in any analytical way, but it just seems like the control arm underperforms what I would expect in a lower risk population. So I'd really like to see um, more detail on this data. I would love to see if there's a, a time-based analysis if what you say. Like, you're so right about the techniques of the radiation. I mean, they haven't changed a little. They've changed like a revolutionary in, in revolutionary ways with the uh, advanced imaging guidance. So I think it would be nice to see a time-based analysis to see if this gap closes over time, maybe with less effective radiation or less targeted radiation. This was more effective. And then over time, as the radiation got better, um, maybe it doesn't show as much of an advantage. I and know. if I can I add to your comment, uh, uh, Leslie, uh, when you consider this standard arm with the, the embrace trial, which is our gold standard, what the radiation oncologists consider the gold standard, at the same follow-up with the population which is uh, more risky in uh, the um, EMBRACE trial because they have uh, a double number of stage three and four, 10% more positive, lymph node positive patient, the control arm in the EMBRACE perform better than this control arm. Right. It reflects simply a different technique, but a technique that in case of locally advanced played the difference for survival of patient. In this moment, uh, the data that Mary showed 10%, only 68% of patients in the experimental arm completed the five cycle of chemotherapy in combination with chemoradiation, which is the standard. Let, let, let me ask, because I'm, I'm real, this is what we're, a lot of us are still thinking about. Let me ask a simple question. Keichi, Monday morning, will you go home and use this regimen on one of your patients? Kiki, yes or no? Pay attention well, to your answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I, I'm not in the position to defend this trial. But I think uh, it's a randomized trial. It took for 10 years. That's fine. But uh, the, uh, at the time, the, the, the standard technique of the radiation has been changing. However, 
the, we are comparing the two different treatment arms mm -hmm. simultaneously. So I think this is a re robust yeah. technique, so I will. Keta, yes Why? or no? Me. <laughs> I will, I'll get, we're going to get to everyone. Keta, yes or no? <laughs> we, we, no, honestly, I want to comment. see more data because okay. before saying yes. this is the new standard. If, if I may, so um, from my point of view, so changing your standard of care just on an abstract that has been not published, I don't think that it will be the most reliable action in okay. your medical practice. This is first. Right. And second... But I'm sorry, but we used carboplatin paclitaxel for endometrial cancer for 10 years before it was published. Yeah. Okay. But we can, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just playing a game. We're, yeah, we're but, I mean, but it was not changed in the standard of care because we it had the from, triplet. Okay, we're outside the scope here, but... Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there are something very important in this study that is the methodology. When you look at the a statistical analysis plan, they say that they have a hierarchical analysis. PFS, if PFS is positive, then they analyze overall survival. And this is an open label trial with a hierarchical analysis. Uh -huh. Let me tell you something. This is an important bias. Because when you have an open label and you have two co-primary endpoints, the lecture, I mean, the statistical testing should be at the same time, you should pre-plan an overall survival analysis at the same time of PFS. Otherwise, PFS, I mean, you, have, you must have a double so blind you're So you're saying no, you wouldn't use it? No, no, I didn't finish, let me finish. No. <laughs> this is the first point. Okay. I mean, this is the first point. The second point, you know, <coughs> regarding this point issue is, how was the follow-up for this patient? I mean, it was just pelvic exam, CT scan, MRI, PET CT. So, how these women were diagnosed with a relapse? So, I think there's a lot of detail that for me are still an answer question that I need to know to see this is my standard of care. For me, right now, it's not my standard of care. And another point, I didn't know how this trial works in those patients who are either positive uh, lymph node or negative lymph node. We are talking previously about the subgroup, and it will be, a, it will be an, a subgroup analysis, but we have the Paola also subgroup analysis. So I think that I am still waiting for more information before changing the standard of care for my patients. So we have a lot to go through. So it's yes, no, no. Leslie, yes or no? I mean, no. But I, I'm excited about the data. You know, I'm excited about there being, I mean, we want as many options and choices available as possible. You could conceivably give a patient induction chemo and still give them PEMRO during and after radiation. You could combine the two approaches, but. And it, real quick, I'll, and we're, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Brian, yeah, it's okay. I, I think you just need, I, I think you need to, um, to interpret the results of this trial in the context of Modern so, radiotherapy. Eight. You guys, are, you're, you're, you're all smarter than I am. So my answer is yes, and it's not for all patients, but if I have a patient tomorrow who comes in with advanced cervical cancer, who doesn't have insurance, who needs to sit with a social worker, who it's going to take two weeks to get a PET scan on, I'm going to give her chemotherapy while I'm getting it all done. Oh, for the same reason, well, why not patient. to give new adjuvant chemo to all patients with ovarian cancer instead of to provide a good primary surgery? That's fair. I'm going to change my answer. You're going to change your answer? I'm going to change my answer. And I think I'm going to, I, I think it makes sense now to do it in the high risk patient population. But the patients that I'm worried about in interlace are those who would be cured, likely be cured by modern chemo radiotherapy. But it was so difficult to show it. A point, a point, right. sorry for breaking yes. you. Just say, go I go. will do it in my high risk population. You don't have any data in your high risk population. You don't have the data right. in lymph node positive. Why are you say that the high risk population will get more benefit than the low risk? You don't have this data. Right. Okay, so you can see so the situation is very often. The issue is very controversial, but coming in a less controversial issue because you know, we oh, are anticipating, yeah. uh, we will anticipate, right. regardless what Brian says, the rule of immunotherapy in locally well, advanced Brian. disease. Brian but has left. <laughs> no, Brian, no, Brian has left. Don't confuse so, me with Brian. I'll walk out. May, may, may I say one last thing about it, the uh, interlace? Yep. I think uh, interlace is very important. Uh, conducted 
under the very limited funding mm -hmm. and the academic trials, it's not funding rich like sure. uh, the pharmaceutical company trials. So we cannot control the, the quality right. and everything. So, so if we, as a tri trialist, demanding the older the investigator to do the, 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 the highest level of the, the resource rich trial. It's not, impo it's, it's not possible for conducting the academic right. pragmatic trial. So. But Keiki, it's a one nation trial. In one nation you can control. The problem in my opinion is not the quality control. I'm sure they did their best and Mary verbalized that the center were qualified. The problem is that the technique changed over time. Yes, I I'm know. sure that was a high quality radiotherapy when the trial was designed. Mm -hmm. But in 10 years, a lot of things has changed mm -hmm. for, uh, for radiotherapy. Okay. Great conversation. Yeah. So, so we will come back later if we have time. So, so <laughs> Tera, so go ahead. Or the first line. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, so that is the future, that this is the present. And uh, Keynote 826 uh, reported the, the benefit uh, of pembrolizumab in the first line setting of advanced or recurrent disease. Um, the trial you remember was a randomized trial combining pembro with the carboplatin or cheese platin paclitaxel in advanced setting. And uh, here we have some difference from country to country because the trial met both the primary endpoint, a significant increase in progression-free and overall survival was reported in CPS score patient, positive patient, but also in the old camer population. This is on the right, the final overall survival data of the trial, but the, the reimbursement change from country to country. In Italy, we can use it only in CPS score positive patient, but in other country, the indication is for the all camer population. For the reason that Anna mentioned, uh, it was a subgroup analysis, not pre-planned, not powered, but some authorities consider that only CPS score positive patient will gain benefit, some other, all the all camer population. And also the toxicity of this triplet uh, is very, very manageable. Less than 5% of patients discontinue treatment because of treatment-related immune adverse event, which is important uh, in a setting in which we can increase overall survival. Probably we cannot cure our patient, but we can increase overall survival. And uh, this morning, Anna, and two days ago in the night at 2.30 in the night, Anna presented the, night. the results of BCC exploring the same concept, same setting with a different drug, atezolizumab and bevacizumab, that in this trial was mandatory. In 826 was a physician uh, if discretion. I may, if oh, I Anna, may. for sure you can. <laughs> so um, I respectfully disagree in the same concept because in the BCC we really explore the concept of adding immunocheckpoint inhibitor to bevacizumab plus chemotherapy. <laughs> the keynote 827 bevacizumab was optional. Yes. And the analysis of bevacizumab was exploratory. So I mean, mm -hmm. the concept of adding IO to bevacizumab was really explored in the BCC trial. Sure, sure, sure. I, I say the same context. I mean the first line setting. No, it's better. <laughs> no, it's better. <laughs> no, no, no. The difference about BEV is important and also because we saw at ESGO the subgroup analysis according to BEV and BEV play a definitive role in the treatment of cervical cancer. And then I reported this morning also the results, both positive primary endpoint, PFS, and overall survival, and several secondary endpoint, all supportive of the combination of immuno plus bevacizumab plus chemotherapy in this setting, and also, Anna, with a very good toxicity profile. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, indeed, we didn't have and didn't see, sorry, any increase in relevant toxicity between the two arms. And uh, the most important point is that the rate of discontinuation was exactly the same in the atezolizumab arm compared with the standard of care, 
90% of the population, the same rate of grade three or greater adverse events and adverse events of special interest in both are for bevacizumab. So I think the safety profile was quite what very well tolerated. Mm -hmm. So a new standard. So uh, may I ask you, uh, Anna, about the BBCC? So, oh, sure. So uh, that same discussion was made at the time of the Paula one was uh, presented. So do we need a bevacizumab? Do we really need bevacizumab? So what is the role of bevacizumab <laughs> in combination with atezol? Do we have? The, the, uh, we didn't have, have the arms without have, having a bevacizumab, right? I mean, I, I think that, you know, that this response um, is not absolutely the same that Paola. So, I mean, we have an established standard of care uh -huh. that is combination of chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. Mm -hmm. This was compared with chemotherapy alone in the GOG 240, and this was became yes. the standard of care. Yes. So the role of adding bevacizumab to chemotherapy is really be well established. Mm -hmm. So we have the standard of care, and now to this standard of care, we add in bevacizumab. So I don't think here in this trial we need another arm only with bevacizumab because we already know what bevacizumab added to chemotherapy. I think it's completely different to the Paola trial and the trial that you are showing. And then the addition of atezolizumab is clear superior. But if you don't feel comfortable enough, then you can look at the keynote A26. Uh -huh. When we are in the subgroup analysis, they compare chemo plus pembro versus chemo plus pembro plus bevacizumab. Uh -huh. And they, they have nicely shown those patients who receive bevacizumab have a better result than those patients who not receive bevacizumab. Uh -huh. okay. So I think the role of bevacizumab in cervical cancer uh -huh. is very well established. Okay. There's no doubt the bevacizumab is, I mean, I would say that it's a must in <coughs> cervical cancer for those patients who are suitable to receive bevacizumab. Maybe too early to answer this, but do we have a preference between A26 and BTC? Which one would you use between Atezo or Pembro? I mean, this is where it's going to be all opinion, right? We're never going to do a head-to-head -head trial. You just, need to use, you just need to use BEV if you can. Use BEV and it doesn't matter? You just need to use BEV if you can, because if you look at BCC, and we were your partner in this, and I worried about BCC after Cala, <laughs> and I thought, you know, all this talk about pd one is not as efficacious as PD-1, and then when we saw these results, I thought, oh, my God, you but, can't but say you that know, anymore. I mean, you know what? I, I think the key point, you know, in the outcome mm -hmm. for BCC is exactly the interaction between anti-BGF and anti-PDL1. Exactly, the because if you look exactly, you're what, the, the synergy, the synergy effect that you see abolishing angiogenesis with abolishing, you know, the immunosuppression environment is key, you know, That's to bring this problem. successful data. Anna, can I ask you, you, you enroll the patient regardless pd one as you nicely Absolutely. showed yeah. this morning, right. but you have the archival tissue. Yeah, 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 we are going to carry out Do the exploratory you analysis. Explore? Yeah. Okay. I wish we wouldn't, you know? I really, this is my opinion. Um, I wish we wouldn't even look because I don't think it matters. It's not, I don't think it's a discernible biomarker. And I really um, wish that we could just put this forward as an all comers uh, population and that with semiplumab, which we'll talk about, and this data set that we could even make a case for. Um, you know, I don't think the FDA would change the label in the US, unfortunately, but just to expand the use of Pembro in this setting. Um, but I think this really underscored to me the importance of bevacizumab because here you've got, what, a 32 month median overall survival, and the 24 month in the keynote A26 was hugely impressive and numerically you would think that this is more but like you said if you pull out that bev treated population and keynote 826 are very similar yeah but you know i i just want to state that this is an interim overall survival we are still yeah. waiting for the final overall survival and the data that we are talking about the keynote 820 is subgroup analysis with the final overall survival yeah. with the longer follow-up when you look at the confidence interval for, for follow-up in the BCC is 30 to 34 months. And when you look at the confidence interval for follow-up in the keynote 826, it's 34, 45 months. Mm -hmm. So I think that we need still, you know, I, I mentioned we are still 
collecting the overall survival data for our patient, and we expect to have the final overall survival data by the end of the next year. I think you deserve a quick commendation for this study because this was also <laughs> academic trial, and um, uh, right. you know, and I really believed in this study. And yeah, congratulations! It's exciting results. Okay. Awesome. Shall we want to move on? Shall we, yeah. Shall we move to the second line? Okay. Yeah, let's move That's to right? the second okay. line. Yeah, so let's get started. So, um, you know, you said it best, Keta, this is an unprecedented time yeah. in the treatment of cervical cancer. I mean, it, not long ago, we just really had almost nothing for our patients. And as soon as we get a drug available in the recurrent setting, we just move it straight up to the front line, <laughs> which is where we need it the most, and that's the right thing to do. Um, but what that happens is that it leaves you um, with um, fewer options. But you can see here that there's so much um, being developed, and now everything needs to be developed in the context of most patients will have been um, checkpoint exposed. Um, so we need to start thinking about our therapies in the terms of, okay, what is rational for a patient who's already had immunotherapy, um, what will they be likely to respond to? And so having set you up terribly um, to talk about Empower, <laughs> you, you have fun. <laughs> now it's your turn. I mean, you know, I think the Empower Cervical One was really a turning point in cervical yeah. cancer because it was the first trial that showed that immunotherapy was superior <laughs> to a standard chemotherapy after platinum failure. At that stage in the state, you have pembrolizumab for those patients who were CPS positive, but in Europe- But only for those. Yeah, but in Europe we have nothing. Right. And then, um, and we're, although we have this kind of hint that it seemed that it was superior to chemotherapy, we haven't tested formally. And then we ran the NGOT CX9 GOG 1316, comparing you know, chemotherapy with a semiplimab anti PD1. And the most important point that you mentioned, you know, we enroll patients regardless of PDL1 status. And then you know we show that semiplima was superior to a chemotherapy in the squamous cell carcinoma population because we had a hierarchical testing and then in the overall survival population. And most interestingly, when we analyze um, to see very clearly it was an exploratory analysis, a post hoc exploratory analysis, we analyzed the outcome according to the PD-1 uh, positive and PDL1 negative, semiplima was superior in both population, in those who express PDL1 and those who express, uh, who don't express PDL1. So, and then this led to a change in the standard of care in Europe and in Japan as well, Keichi. Now we have semiplima full approved in Europe and in Japan, but I something that we need to keep in mind for those patients who are immunotherapy naive. That's true. Right. So, and now this landscape is changing. If we are moved to pembrolizumab to first line, or artesolizumab to first line, or pembrolizumab to locally advanced cervical cancer. So, how many patients in the near future will be naive of immunotherapy? So, it is something that we need to start uh, thinking, thinking of about. because now those patients, unfortunately, relapse and then we need to offer a new option for those patients who have, ya, who have just received immunotherapy. So, Leslie, what can we do? <laughs> Take this from you. Well, I think that, you know, don't forget this option if your patient's not had checkpoint in the front line or in the first line metastatic setting that um, all patients should really have an opportunity to get checkpoint um, at at so, some point. Leslie, you're one of the leaders of cervical cancer in the U.S. Do you think our patients in the U.S. are at a disadvantage because we don't have the approval of simulimumab? Or do you think it really is a wash? Well, now we have it on the NCCN, so we could have access to it, and we all have it in our clinics. Um, and I think a lot of us have been using it sort of for vulvar cancer, for the squamous cell, right. skin indications. Right. We have access. So you think um, we'll use it more for some of our... our I think for the non-exposed patient, you would. Okay. And then having that not be um, PD-1 restricted is, is um, really helpful, or CPS restricted is, is helpful. Um, so we can circle back to this after we go over the next sure. couple of um, data rounds because we want to kind of think about, okay, how would we sequence things as we go? Um, so Destiny Pantumer, 
I, I just want to know from the audience, like how many of you saw the Destiny Pan Tumor data presented or have heard of it <laughs> recently? <laughs> so it's getting out there. I'm surprised, yeah, good, good. I'm surprised it's not everyone because no I everyone. feel like it's no very top everyone. of mind. Um, so Destiny Pan Tumor took a HER2 targeted um, antibody drug conjugate and um, looked at several tumor types and it's a basket trial for um, HER2 positive tumors. And so we know that endometrial, cervical, and ovarian tumors um, express HER2. And for cervical cancer, um, we don't think it's that. I think it's more, it's probably, uh, in the study, it was um, around 5%. I think that as we test more, we'll see a higher uh, percentage of HER2. And we know that it is uh, more common in the adenocarcinomas who um, are more high risk, which if is If I may, just a comment. Yes, please do. Yeah, um, because maybe the slide, the slide could be a little bit confusing. So mm -hmm. um, in the Destiny Pan Tumor 2, we enroll patients only who have overexpression, no mm -hmm. mutation, no amplification, it's only overexpression, uh, two plus or three plus locally. And another important point that we are working on that is that um, in contrast to breast and gastric cancer that we have clear guideline to determine overexpression of HER2, in gynae tumor, we are not yet on that pathway. And now in the destiny pan tumor, we determine overexpression of HER2 according to the gastric guideline. Mm -hmm. And only those who were two plus and three plus were eligible. Another thing is amplification, and mutation. And okay. here in the slide, we wanted to show you that there has been overexpression. Around 5% of the patients with cervical cancer have mutation in cervical cancer. But these patients were not eligible for destiny pan tumor 0 2. Just and I think that's an important point, right? Absolutely. Because why is that? Because this is not an anti HER2 therapy. This is just using the ligand. The expression to get of the into protein. The cell, right? So it's a very different sort of paradigm and you did the summit study, which yeah. is, ab is abrogating the HER2 exactly. pathway and it's a totally different approach. Totally different. And it, you would think, you, you, you may interpret them as the same no. approach, but they're totally different approaches. Leslie, if I can yeah. comment, this is the way to move forward the, the clinical research in all the tumor, identify the biomarker and get the pro appropriate drug. And when I look at this response rate, 75% in 3 plus, 40% in, I know this uh, response rate that we do not obtain in first line with the two or three drugs <laughs> in combination. Yeah. And uh, this is a really impressive. Patient enrolled in Pandestiny has uh, up to two prior line of therapy. So uh, really- It also helps yeah. to have an incredibly effective therapy, right? I think this is also, in addition to the biomarker, it is also very effective. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I, we're, we're really critiquing some of the papers out there and, you know, fine-tuning which way we're going to go, yes or no. But the data here is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you get um, staining back and they use breast criteria instead of gastric criteria, don't say it, the data here is unprecedented. The NCCN gave this a listing without a paper. Okay, so it's NCCN guidelines if you have based two or three plus. Based on 40 plus, patients. Based like, on I don't 40 th patients. I think that's also unprecedented. I don't think that's ever happened. So, so we, we're going to do other formal, well-controlled, randomized trials in this setting to figure out what are the best patients to use this treatment on, but if for some reason, if you do staining in cervical can in your cervical cancer patients for this, and if it is positive and you have access to it, you can give someone a 75, 40 to 75% response rate, where we're talking about chemotherapy on T, what, 5%? Given TV, you get 24 to 17%. Yeah, that is a point that we um, forgot to make with the semiplomab. I mean, the response rate to chemotherapy was so much lower. It was already, the target was what, about 15%, but in semiplomab, about 6%, and we'll see that that was replicated in the TV3 yeah. one. And, and uh, there's another important point, not only is the high rate of response rate, but the duration of response. Oh, yeah. And we are talking yeah. about a heavily pretreated population, you know, more than 40% of the patients have received at least three prior line of therapy. Cervical cancer, more than three prior line of therapy. Look at the median PFS. Yeah. No, I mean, it's amazing. The curves yeah, are really amazing. This is another it slide is. that's a little confusing. So the top, the orange bar is the IHC 3+, plus. the blue is the 2+. Plus. 
Mm -hmm. And the green is sort of the, the, the average of both. So, I mean, to me, that looks differential for the three plus. So I feel like that's what needs to be validated yeah, um, but, moving but, forward. And I agree with you that it's unprecedented, but. But again, um, when, they, they, when they did central review on these patients after local review, they sound, found a percentage of them were actually one plus, and they still responded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's very few things in, med, in, in life that are certain. But if you have a patient with recurrent cervical cancer and you have access to this drug and she's three plus her two, you need to, I, I think it's very, you really need a compelling reason not to give it with the whatever percent response rate that we've seen there. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, this is a GYN, this isn't a cervical conference, it's GYN. Look at the data outside the scope of this talk. Look at the data for endometrial, 85%. Ovarian's even high too. It's not on NCCN yet, but we'll see. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. I've already given this to two patients. We never time. disagree. So. <laughs> Maybe not. It's only Ken and I disagree. Uh, always. <laughs> so um, the, the drug is very well tolerated, and you know, I have, I have less experience. I'm just starting to get experience with, but I'm you know my medical oncologist has a lot of experience using this with breast, and they're like, oh, it's fine. They do, you know, it's really well tolerated, kind of in a, from an experiential perspective. Um, um, do need to look out for um, pneumonitis, um, which is an important side effect of all the ADCs, but particularly um, with trastuzumab deruxtecan. So the, is this drug going to the phase three now? Oh, I don't think, think we just have, a, we don't really have a plan so far. For what? For phase three, phase not, three. no. No, not just yet. Not going to the phase three yet? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're all of us on stage were excellent clinical researchers, and we don't talk about things till it's in the public domain. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what's available, at least in the U.S. Yes. now, and hopefully, um, and you saw a great <laughs> presentation this morning um, of the tesodomab and 301. This is another antibody drug conjugate that uh, targets tissue factor and has an MMAE um, microtubule poison payload, um, and it's its proposed mechanism of action is not just cytotoxic, but also um, having a cytotoxic bystander effect and also an antibody-dependent um, cellular uh, phagocytosis effect, so a little bit of an immune therapy. Um, so this was um, FDA approved in the U.S. And under accelerated approval as a single agent. Um, the TV205 study looked at TV in combination in uh, several different settings. So this is a little bit of a busy slide on the top. You can see a dose escalation phase. Um, there were three arms, um, TV Bev, TV Pembro, and TV Carbo. Um, and these were all in the second line for the dose escalation. Um, and all of these could be given at their um, standard dosing. Uh, there you did not have to dose reduce either drug um, when it was um, given as a doublet. And the dose expansion phase moved the TV, carb TV, Carbo, and Pembro combos up into the front line. Um, so this is provocative. I mean, this, was, this is the 24826 space where you're using a non-platinum containing, well, not for carboplatin, but you're using, um, in, in essence, sort of de-escalated therapy in that setting. And then the um, arm F was TV, Pembro combination in the second and the third line. Um, and so the primary endpoint of the dose expansion was uh, response rate. And here are the responses. So you can see um, several and deep responses. So in the first line, I mean, your bar here is what, 65% for Keno 826. What's the bar in VCC for ORR? Do Complete need... response? ORR. Oh. 80%. 80%. So those are the bars. So you can see these are impressive, but quite a bit lower um, than the chemotherapy um, triplet and quad combinations in the front line. And the second and third line, TV by itself had a 24% response rate, and then Pembro restricted to PDO1 positive 14. So this is at least additive with 35% response rate, and the duration of response is very impressive. So I actually use this TV Pembro combination in my practice. I've been able to access this, and I've had good results with this. And um, anecdotally, I've even used this combination in IO exposed patients because I just want to try to give them the best chance possible. And this is what we have in this space currently. 
And then these are the um, side effect profiles. Again, you could get, you can combine these safely. And then what you see are additive AEs from either drug. So for you know carboplatin, you're seeing more of the bone marrow suppression. Um, Pembro, more of the um, IO, but really very well tolerated across the board. And then with tisodimab, you're seeing the ocular toxicity, um, the bleeding side effects, and then the uh, peripheral neuropathy. So Dr. Professor Vergote at ESMO and now Brian at uh, IGCS did a great job today presenting um, the TV301 data. Um, so this is the confirmatory trial for tisodimab as a single agent in the second and third line. Um, this is designed very, very similar to Empower. These patients were uh, really the same population. They were randomized to tisodimab, vidotin versus physician's choice chemotherapy, and really the same agents um, here. And the breakdown of the number of prior regimens, as you can see here, 60, about a little about, about 60% had had one prior uh, regimen and 37%, um, 40% had had two prior lines of therapy. So this is a pretty pre-treated population. Uh, most patients had received prior bevacizumab, 65%. And interestingly, and this is the, I think this trial has the most information that we have currently on IO exposed patients because about 30, almost 30% 30 of the patients had had prior um, checkpoint inhibitor. Yeah, if I may, yeah, um, no, for sure. Uh -huh. uh, Leslie, I think it's quite important to have the use of previous uh, PD-1 or PDL one as a stratification factor because, I mean, you know, this trial is covering what we are seeing, you know, that the PDL one agents has been incorporated in earliest lines. So then we will have the information about if we prescribe, we treat our patient with TB after <coughs> immunotherapy, this drug still works. So because the data that we had uh, previously from the uh, Professor <coughs> Holeman published in The Lancet, I mean, in this trial, you know, TB show a great overall response rate of 24% with a median duration of eight months. But in this trial, we didn't have the information about the potential use of TB after PD-1. And I think, you know, this, this trial, uh, fortunately, you know, provide with this information in this new era of immunotherapy in earlier lines. That's a great point. And I'm glad we're getting there a little bit quicker than I thought. <laughs> so it was interesting to see this much uptake in the study. So the study meant its primary endpoint of overall survival um, with the hazard ratio of uh, 0.7. That was statistically significant. And, um, you know, there's a lot of talk going on about the medians um, for the overall survival and for the progression-free survival and having um, not a huge benefit, not a huge difference in the median um, PFS here, so three versus 4.9 months, but still you have a positive um, hazard ratio of 0.67. So I wanna stop here and just ask you all what you think of that argument, because I think it's really important point to um, try to um, interpret these data. Yeah, I think it's quite important. So, I mean, the good thing right now is that we are talking about the different options in metastatic cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. A decade ago, our option were carbotaxol, taxol, carbo, gemcitabi, ininotica, pemetrexet, nothing more. Mm -hmm. And we know that the chemotherapy single, single agent, you know, have a very poor performance uh, in cervical cancer. So, the point is that um, when we look at this kind of phase three trial, we should look at the hazard ratio because it mm -hmm. will really inform you about the benefit yeah. of a new drug. You look at the hazard ratio for overall survival, that is the primary endpoint, is 0 0.7. It means 30% in the reduction of death. And it's something that you bear in mind that giving Tisotumab vedotin to your patient, you are dramatically reducing the risk of death. And it's something that is very important. 
and PFS is important, but honestly, in the second, third line of therapy in metastatic cervical cancer, the most important thing is to prolong overall survival. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, most of these patients have received only, only no, already two prior line of therapy, third line of therapy, so we don't know how many lines they will be able to receive. So, for me, the bottom line is that Tisotumab Vedotim, after first line of therapy, plus minus, minus pdl one reduce the risk of death for our patient with cervical mm -hmm. cancer. If I can add a comment, uh, two comments. If I look at what chemotherapy gives in this patient, 5% overall response rate, mm -hmm. zero complete response, two months PFS, it's evident that we need better treatment for advanced disease and giving that immunotherapy will be moved earlier and earlier in the algorithm. New drugs are welcome for cervical cancer patients. The second consideration is that now we have drugs in cervical cancer that increase overall survival in later line. Right. We have bevacizumab, we have Pembro, uh, Atezo, Tisotumab vedotin. We are moving in a very similar situation to ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. in which in the adjuvant setting, uh, we demonstrate quite easy that we are able to increase PFS, but with more difficulty in demonstrating than increase in overall survival. Probably when we think about the clinical research, future clinical research in cervical cancer, we have to consider also this aspect. Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, so we need better lines. It's an unmet need in the second and third line setting. Um, you know, the, the chemotherapy doesn't work in the setting. And it's actually, you know, when we look at it, it's the delivery of the chemo because we have a, a site of kill in the ADC, so it's getting the chemo into the cells that's what we need to do. Um, it's, it's data here that shows it. You know, I think uh, you presented a little bit earlier some of the earlier combinations, and maybe that'll push Pembro, I'm sorry, TV into earlier line setting, but for now, off protocol in the second or third line setting. You know, and now, you know, we're gonna see, if we see the, the, the Pember going into the front with the radiation, the A18 data, you know, this, it's, it's a wide open unmet need that this will fit nicely into. But, but I'm curious because now we are talking about the phase three, you in the, in the state has already the approval based on the phase two. But I would like to know from the audience, how many of you have already used Tisotumab Vedotin in your daily practice? You use TV? One, two, three, four, six, six. <laughs> you are not You're the counting audience. on one hand. Less than 10 you people. Are Less than 10. Well, you know, so Paul, have, raise your hand if you <coughs> haven't used it, but it's available. So it's available, but you haven't used it. So if it's available, you're using it. Yeah. Okay. Because so that gives a better Less idea. than 10 physicians have already used this to map with the thing in the daily in practice. This room, but yeah. In, in this room, I mean, in this room, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a room full of specialists in gynecological yeah. Yeah. tumors. So I think there's a lot of, uh, I mean, work ahead of us, you know, in terms to, to, to show this data and to see how Tisotumab vedotin may improve overall survival of our patients. And another important aspect, lately that you will be on all the panel, in agreement with me is to show uh, how the potential side effect can be managed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about that. Right. So in the, the key subgroups, um, all patients benefited. There's some interesting data here on prior BEV versus no prior BEV. I think a no prior BEV treated population is a higher risk of sicker population is, um, because of why you're withholding the BEV. And think about why you've got pelvic disease, radiated yeah. field. I mean, I think those are the more difficult patients to treat. There is no rationale. Of, uh, to explain it. To explain, mm -hmm. and also the, the phase two gave a completely different message. Sure, this true. is the weakness of <laughs> the subgroup true, analysis right? according to Forrest Plot, but because there is no rationale. That, that may be the most important point, is that they were, <laughs> they were um, exactly. in contradiction to each other. So this, this Forrest Plot is not even though the FDA uses as a, gar a basis for approval it is not a valid it's hypothesis generating. So here's the treatment related adverse events to your point. And um, I think, you know, this is a learning curve. Um, some, many of us have some experience now with mervatexumab, a drug with ocular toxicity. 
Um, this drug has a different ocular toxicity than mervituximab. It's mostly surface toxicity with keratitis and conjunctivitis. Uh, but it definitely can be mitigated. Um, and you can see the full side effect profile here of tisodomab versus chemotherapy, where your chemotherapy has more of the uh, bone marrow suppression um, related, and then the um, tisodomab with the AEs of special interest for that drug. Um, so we mentioned the ocular toxicity. I think, you know, someone with experience of the drug, with the drug, um, I spend more time managing the, the neuropathy from the drug than I do the ocular toxicity. Um, so as long as you are using the mitigation strategies, um, I think that the ocular toxicity is very manageable. Mm -hmm. Anyone have comments here? Yep, that's a, that's a very important point. So, so the, yeah, I think for me the, the, the bottom line and the take-home message, because I mean sometimes you know ocular events um, are a little bit scary for people who are not aware of that. Mm -hmm. I think you know that there are wonderful educational programs, you know, to know how can you implement this mitigation measure and can you prevent your patient from developing this kind of high toxicity. But uh, on top of that, although the patient may develop this kind of high toxicity, at the end of the day, the rate of discontinuation, I mean, is only 5.6%. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's this that you can manage with holding the therapy, reducing the dose, and at the end of the day, the patient is able to continue on therapy. Only 5% of the patient need to discontinue the therapy. When you look at the rate of discontinuation, the PAR inhibitor is between 11% and 50%, so I think it's lower than we mm -hmm. see in the daily practice. But I think this is very important, you know, to teach the, the, the doctor who have never used this drug, mainly in this kind of mitigation measures. Yeah, so, so Oh, no, oh. I'm... Oh, me? Oh, okay, thank you. So, so when we did this trial in Japan, we mandated to, uh, to, to refer those patients on the trial who are randomized to the uh, TV mm -hmm. to refer to the eye doctor. Right. Ophthalmologist. Is that the way that the, the daily practice pattern in the United States? Uh, so, right. so, so, um, so on protocol, Mm -hmm. On the, proto, uh, the, the, the previous accelerated approval in this protocol, it required to have an eye exam prior and to have an aggressive ocular mitigation strategy with corticosteroid drops, with, with cold packs over the eyes, and with adequate irrigation. Um, and, it, and when the accelerated approval came through, it came with a warning that they needed an ophthalmologic exam prior to each cycle. That wasn't really studied that way, but that's what they had. And now in this trial, in 301, what we did is we um, gave uh, a day before we started with the eye drops the day before, and it's pro you know, we're not sure if it actually did anything. And we also only required the um, eye exam prior. Um, we'll see moving forward if that's changed, if we're able to to, to go away from that. So in my practice, um, you know, there, there's a black box warning. So in my practice, I tell my patients what the recommendations are. I tell I, I work with my ophthalmologists. We have a form that. Um, we sent to the, op the eye doctor because they want to know, what do you want to know? I said, just fill out the form, it's fine. Um, and it makes it really easy. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I'm compliant. Sometimes a patient will say to me, do I really need to go? I said, well, it's recommended, but your eyes are doing fine. Ultimately, it's up to you. I'm not going to take the, if something happens, I'm not going to take the, the crit hit on it. But, you know, yeah. I, I think it's recommended. I think sometimes with the resources are limited to get into an eye doctor's tough. But to give the uh, patients the opportunity to get a drug, we, we have to embrace that. But it doesn't require a high level ocular specialist, right? An optometrist, and I don't know how that is divvied up in other countries, but an optometrist can do a slit lamp surface exam and a visual acuity. I mean, it's really simple. It's like um, GYN oncologists doing um, very simple benign GYN work. Like you don't necessarily need an ophthalmologist unless the patients are having um, issues and as you can see, most of the ocular toxicity is low grade um, and, and, and manageable. So often just with a dose hold, they get better and they don't really even, uh, it's recommended sure. they see an ophthalmologist, but they could 
Go As a for all new class of agent in clinical practice, we have to perform a learning curve in the management mm. of side effects. We, we are you able to use immunotherapy. At the beginning, we were scared. We will <laughs> start using also tisotoma. I want to point out the peripheral neuropathy. This is uh, uh, ocular effects are not a problem in my experience. With the, the mitigation strategies, uh, are not a problem. But uh, probably we need to pay attention to peripheral neuropathy. In most part of cases, it's a sensitive neuropathy, which is typical of the payload. Sometimes maybe a motorial neuropathy. This is an aspect that you have to be proactive in asking your patient if they experience particular fatigue, weakness in the arm. So this is an aspect that should be uh, evaluate. That's a great yeah. point because I expected the taxol neuropathy, right? Yeah. That is not... Uh, the get. point is that you, you have an ADC and then you don't think about it, a, neuro, a ne neurotoxicity because it's like you associate a neurotoxicity to chemotherapy, but indeed every single ADC has a payload that is cytotoxic agents. Exactly. So I think it's very important because if you <laughs> identify early, I mean, you stop the drug, I mean, you put the drug on hold, and then you resume in the lower level, I mean, you can absolutely prevent from developing a grade three toxicity. Mm -hmm. So, but at the end of the day, as every new agent, is, is a matter of education, it's a matter of training. Um, but I mean, the bottom line will be don't be scared of using a new drug because at the end of the day, you know, you can learn how to manage of the potential side effect. You can be scared, just don't do it. Just still do it and learn, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Great. Great. All right. Okay, Great so case study. Yes. Brian? Uh, maybe the audience has any question. Please don't be shy. We have the microphone over there. Hey, there you go. Uh, I have a question regarding the um, groups that the drug was tested. Um, because you had some interesting graphs earlier before. Uh, was the group, uh, was the drug tested as well in, uh, in the special focus of the um, ovarian cancer patients who are with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, or that wasn't even um, taken into the consideration of the study? So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you're asking, like we, we know in ovarian cancer trials, there's a differentiation between BRCA patients and non-BRCA patients, BRCA ah, okay. patients. So that was but but yeah, in cervical cancer, we don't see that as much. We've been looking to see if the <laughs> PD-1 expression can be that dichotomy, and it's probably not, because the, the, oh, the expression rate is probably 90% or more. Um, and then other factors that we've been looking at really haven't panned out. So it's really all comers with cervical cancer, except for that small group of PD-1s that okay. we're seeing. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank yes, ma'am. Maureen? I'm Dr. Maureen from Nigeria. We just finished from our GCICCCRN uh, session where we talk about clinical trials. Mm -hmm. I noticed that most of your presentation, your clinical trial sites were usually Europe, Mexico, and you never mentioned any African site. Now I'm wondering, do we also believe that the results you got over there can be replicated in Africa? Yeah. Considering our genetic uh, mm -hmm. Diversities and cultural effect. Yeah. How do we continue using all these results and the drug trials in Africa yeah. without any trial or significant trials mm -hmm. have been carried out yeah. in Africa? We totally agree with you. And um, I mean, all of us care about this and mm -hmm. we talk about this um, quite a lot. And I think that, you know, it with it, the infrastructure that it requires to run a clinical trial makes it very difficult to do um, in more lower resource settings, but we need to figure out a way to make it yeah. work. I know we're working on some ways in the US to decentralize our trials and to, we have, we have under-resourced areas in the United States um, and we need to get the trials to those uh, please, considering yep. the personalization of research is going on there, mm -hmm. is there no way to step down some of this trial in Africa? 
Actually, we have some of the facilities on the infrastructures, yeah. and I believe the bottlenecks can be also, we can overcome it using collaborations. Mm -hmm. Do we continue with this persistent research over there and practicing or use of the drug in Africa? Yeah. The latest research showed that most of the drugs we are using, mm -hmm. that African involvement, I being African both American, black American and real African people, mm -hmm. that were not up to 4% in that trial. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and we try looking at the morbidity and mortality of cancer in Africa and looking more at our genetic company in this cancer, clinical right. trial. Right. While right. trying to collaborate with us instead yeah. of mm -hmm. borrowing whatever we do outside, to practicalize it within us where we were not involved in the trial. Mm -hmm. Thank that you. Is, so, so you. First of all, thank you for coming to the yeah. microphone. It's not easy to raise that issue. It's not a popular opinion. All right, secondly, a lot of times we give an answer which is gray, gray, gray. You're a thousand percent right. Yeah. All right, yeah. You're, you're a thousand percent right. And there's no, we can't say, well, it's tough to do a trial there, all this stuff. And this isn't only on us as investigators. Okay, it's us as a society because cervical cancer is a bigger um, it, it hits home a lot harder in Africa than it does. And you're right, the fact that we had two to three or four percent of women on this trial that were, happened to be black and they lived in the United States doesn't translate over to an African population. No. So while it's all on us, it's also on the drug companies. And they don't, and we, we, we sit in conferences, doctors alone talking to some of these, and, and we all need to figure out a way to do it. There'll be a, an expense involved. But you're right, we cannot translate the results of this trial no. over to how it'll work in Africa or other LMICs, let's just not call Africa, you know, call them all out, without um, investing in that, coming up with the sound research to, to answer those questions, and then once we answer those questions, to make those drugs available to those countries that can otherwise not afford them. But thank you for raising that question. Yeah. Sorry, may I ask one question about the uh, interest trial? Um, after uh, introducing chemotherapy, tomorrow volume, tomorrow volume might be decreasing, so radiology oncologist how to uh, decide um, treatment plan. So it, that, that plan should be uh, based on pre, be, before chemotherapy CT or after chemotherapy CT. Yeah, that's a great question. If you didn't hear him, the question in the back is, well, you measure this tumor. Right? But then you're going to say, you're not going to start radiation. You're going to give interlace, give chemotherapy. So the tumor that you measured from the beginning is shrinking. You know, and this is another question about using the resources that you have available. There's a lot of radiation oncology units in the US that every week they change their radiation field. With, and they're getting real-time MRI imaging mm. to change that. So a lot of it is depends. Um, it's based on the resources we have available. Mm -hmm. Some areas that are treating more cervical cancers don't have those resources. But we need to do the best that we can in partnering and teaming with our radiation oncologists to follow the, 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 hopefully the shrinkage of the tumor and to then give the optimal dose for effective radiation while limiting the toxicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Can I add a comment on this, Brian, but in general of the session, we are here celebrating uh, Pembro, Interlace, uh, uh, Kinote 26, BCC, Tisotumab. I just want to remember that this is a preventable disease. This is a tumor for which we have a sign, primary prevention, secondary prevention with screening. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I think that the effort of the global community for this tumor in particular should yeah. be put on yeah, the prevention. Mm -hmm. And if we invest in prevention, with Bassine, with the HPV test, with PAP test, probably the amount of disease will reduce over time, and all this drug will be available for lesser and lesser patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we, I think we're, we're, we agree completely. I mean, the best way in globally, not only in those countries, to exactly. the best way to cure cervical cancer is to prevent cervical cancer. The best way to do that is by global, um, you know, use of of HPV vaccines. We know that'll decrease cancer. So yes, but I think the point is there are going to be some, even in all communities, we're going to get patients that get cervical cancer. We need to figure out the best treatments for them. And we've been through this with originally with the HIV treatments and things like that. We have to go after globally in order to get solutions, not just in the areas that can afford the medicines. Okay, so uh, we only have Let's, the 30 minutes left. How much so, time? 
13. 13 minutes left. So I think uh, oh, it's Brian. And again, audience, so we welcome you to for your participation by uh, the, during this session. And please feel free to join on our topic by using yeah, I think the good news is we're, uh, we're supposed to foster a lot assistant. of communication. Thank you for that. And we've had a lot of communication. So we have a couple of cases. We're going to actually ask for some of your feedback. When the questions come up, there's going to be a little one of those QRS codes. If you hit that, it'll come right onto your web how to answer it on your phone. Um, case number one, 42 year old female, six weeks of vaginal bleeding, pelvic pain, and dysuria. Went to her gynecologist, founding a six centimeter mass then referred to a gynecologic oncologist. The biopsy showed a squamous cell carcinoma in the cervix. Testing was done, and this had a CPS score of less than one. Less than one. Patient was treated at this point with chemosensitizing radiotherapy with cisplatinum, and she responded well. Eight months after completion of the radiotherapy, she presented the clinic with a cough, and further workup revealed multiple pul pulmonary nodules consistent with metastatic disease on CT scan of the chest. Here's your QRS code. Give you a second to turn your phones on. Um, the question here is, what would be the appropriate treatment for this patient? A, carboplatin paclitaxel. B, carboplatin paclitaxel and bevacizumab. As an aside, let's assume you have everything available. So based on the knowledge you have, not based on your practice, because we understand. Oh, Siri didn't like that. C, carboplatin paclitaxel, bevacizumab, and pembrolizumab if, in fact, it's available the, um, based on H26. And um, clinical trial enrollment, and only if you know if there's a clinical trial available, not just in general, people put patients with clinical trial. So you give some time. Leslie, they didn't have music, so they said you were going to sing for 15 seconds. I thought you were going to moonwalk. <laughs> was, oh, we were going to play um, Hey Jude. Oh, uh, I can do that. <laughs> All right, let's, um, can we pull the, the answers up on the screen? Here you go. Good. So, so you know, this is, a, um, this is a great question to start off with. So <laughs> carboplatin and paclitaxel um, represents the minority, the, um, which is good because we sort of talked about here, the question came up, do you need to have an arm that doesn't include bevacizumab? Based on the work of Tuari and Monk, we found in GOG240 that those patients did better with bevacizumab. So, um, Pro, unless Bev was contraindicated, I would probably stay away from A. Um, now, I want to remind everyone, we said CPS score of less than one, right? So CPS score is less than one. In the US, you can't get pembrolizumab with a negative um, CPS score. Hmm. In Europe, neither. In Europe, not, neither. Neither. So. Um, in Japan, yes. In Japan, you can use. In Japan, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the people aren't changing their answers. So, so based on so next was carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab. That would be the standard of care, GOG two forty. Um, carboplatin, paclitaxel, bev, and pembro. Right now it's winning, but there's probably a lot of people in the audience from Japan, so they're favoring that vote. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then clinical Always trial enrollment well. is five. Um, so. Um, my comment is, I, I would, here I would give carboplatin, paclitaxel, and bevacizumab. We're short of time. Anyone disagree? Any questions from the audience on that? I'm hoping I'm saying it clearly, but I know sometimes I don't say things very clearly. Do you know why we're leaning towards the regimen without checkpoint inhibition? So as the indication stands now, you can only get that if it's available. So let, again, we have less than 10 minutes left, so let's move forward. Um, the patient does well on the triplet regimen. Five months after completion, the patient has abdominal discomfort. CT scan of the abdomen pelvis reveals liver metastases. In an ideal world, which, which of these would be an optimal treatment regimen if all of them were approved and available in your country in the future? Single agent chemotherapy, tizotumab, bedotin, pembrolizumab, simiplumab, or a clinical trial if, in fact, you have one available. We'll give you time to answer one here. <laughs> Difficult, <laughs> Difficult question. All right, now remember here, I'll give you guys a hint. There's probably two right answers here, and we sort of talked about this a little bit. Well, there's, there's always a right answer, but two answers that'll be most um, chosen here. So let's, let's pull up the slide. 
and even while we have it, keep going on. Wow. So good. I like single agent chemotherapy as a reminder for my talk today. Five percent response rate. Five percent, and comparing that to today's data at 301, 17.6 percent response. Comparing it to the accelerated approval, 24 percent. So chemotherapy is not the right answer. Um, there's a lot of folks from CGen and GenMab with their phones on, so they're choosing TV, which is the right answer. <laughs> uh, one of the right answers, based on the data, and we don't have to go through it again. But um, prior to giving it, they all got an eye exam, and they, per FDA warning, they got an eye exam before each cycle. Now, pembrolizumab, um, there is a role here, and if it's available, I don't, th I don't think it's wrong to get pembro in the setting if it's available. Remember, CPS less than one. But we were talking about earlier how simiplumab does have an approval, um, an NCSN listing, and that's um, biomarker agnostic. So the two ways, at least in the U.S., and I think in Europe as well, in order to treat this patient would be either with TV or simiplumab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or the combination. Or the combination. But then we're getting, let's... <laughs> one I know. The combination is far away in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I think it's a great discussion. So, you know, in front of a patient who is immunotherapy naive, um, the patient doesn't apply in the state for pembrolizumab because it's CPS negative, but apply in order for a semiplima. How do you make the decision between tisotumab, vetotin, and semiplima? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think our, our, the drugs we have in the closet are armamentarian for cervical cancers limited. I would feel more comfortable if, if, if I'm going to, I'll just say it this way, lose a patient to cervical cancer, I'd rather her have gotten a checkpoint at some point in her treatment plan. So Absolutely. I would probably err in this situation to start in simiplumab, hopefully to get something, and then knowing that I have TV in reserve. And it doesn't appear Mariana, that I agree with you. But at the end, I agree with you at Finally, the end of this. Agree. <laughs> no, also because if you look you at the, the very hard to very. keynote 158 data and also the semiplumab, mm -hmm the number of prior line of therapy play a role in the efficacy. So probably in an immune-naive patient, my first choice would be immunotherapy. Also because you have a less exhausted immune system and then move to TB soon after. And if, if you didn't hear Leslie, she said both, but that'll be the topic both of next year's ISS. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I want to add a little bit more controversy. Um, last year, we published um, some analysis of the efficacy of semiplimab uh, according to the location of the metastasis. Those patients with liver met, it doesn't seem to get more benefit from semiplimab compared with chemotherapy. So I think that we need to have all the information in the puzzle uh, before making the, the decision. So, I don't think that in this patient with liver mass progressing after six months of platinum, I don't know if I would treat her with this instead of semi. A question from the audience. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, case. Actually, it's very interesting. Uh, I'm facing the same case actually like maybe two months ago. Uh, but like I, in the first treatment, uh, she gets take chemo, BEV, and immunotherapy at Bimpro and she recurrence again, and unfortunately, TV is not available. So uh, will you challenge again with PIMPRO, or you just go for single chemo or clinical trials? This is one of the uh, dilemma that I'm facing sometime. Yeah, that's yeah. a good question. That's, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, if I'm going to re-challenge, I'd re probably re-challenge with bevacizumab with the chemotherapy. Um, I'm, I'm more comfortable with giving, you know, the, the, and I can't give you the answer. I'm more comfortable giving BEV after BEV than IO after okay. IO. Um, exactly. I go with trials. You mentioned you have trial option. No, I don't have. Yeah, that's you right. don't have it's trial that, It's option. even PIMPRO yeah. or single agents. Yeah. Then I agree with Brian if you don't have a trial option. Yeah. Um, that was a good question. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Um, we have three minutes left, so we're going to quickly go through case number two. 33-year-old um, female, um, lack of a pap smear for 15 years. She presents her GYN with pelvic pain and bleeding with intercourse, three centimeter cervical mass. Biopsy showed adenosquamous carcinoma of the cervix. She, in fact, had a CPS score of greater than one. MRI shows lymphadenopathy. PET scan reveals um, disease to spread to the lymph nodes nowhere else. 
based on our observation, we've, sort of, we're gonna, we're not gonna, we've already gone through this a little bit, but we want to hear what the audience thinks. Based on your observation, our discussion of interlace, <laughs> would you consider administering what? interlace regimen to this patient if it becomes available and receives approval? <laughs> yes or no? That's the moment no that you have to vote. No more discussion. <laughs> Turn her phone Don't off. Don't close. What? Get eyes ready to make yeah. a peek. <laughs> yes, interlace or no, not. <laughs> we're not. We're going to move on. We're not going to discuss. We're just going to see what the answer is. <laughs> okay. All right. Wow, great. Oh. oh my God. So, Keiichi, we, we convinced them in a different way than... Uh, I thought that uh, this patient has an extra pelvic disease, right? No? Lymph nodes, oh, uh, not okay. extra pelvic disease. Oh, just okay. okay, got it. 35. We convinced them. <laughs> yes. Keta, did you, were you one of the 36 or were you one of the... <laughs> I was in the 37 for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I was in the 5%. Yeah, that's good. It's interesting though, right? Because we, we, we really talked, dove into the statistics, the limitations, the strengths and everything. It's interesting and we're blessed that we have an audience here representing you know, folks that are academic and also a lot of folks that are in the trenches. And whether we like it or not, whether we agree or not, this is what we're going to see happening. And we're going to have to be able to treat patients who, are, who recurred after receiving this, whether we like it or not. Brian, again, uh, always better to have more option for a patient that w had no option as uh, until uh, two months ago. Uh, I think that we need really more information about the interlace before considering the new standard. There are se several great points, but. I, I agree, it's a, it's a pragmatic way to move forward, but sometimes the best treatment for our patient is not pragmatic. Otherwise, we do, again, new adjuvant chemo to all ovarian cancer patients that is pragmatic, but is not the best we have. Great, I agree. So we've um, almost a little over a minute left. Let me finish these up and then we'll have Keith you a chance to say the final word to okay. thank everyone. But really quickly here, she recurs. I don't think there's any controversy here. CPS greater than one, if available, offering the quadruplet therapy. We would agree on that. Um, let's just move forward to the next text. We can go past this question, guys. And finally, now this isn't as controversial as the other one. If she recurs after receiving a checkpoint, on the first case we talked about simiplumab versus TV, now that she's already gotten a checkpoint, um, anyone should, would anyone not choose B here? We have consensus at the end. Ken and I agree at the end. I want to thank everyone, and then Keisha, thanks for having me here. And okay, do, do you want to see the result? Then? Oh, we can see the result. Oh, that's no? all. Okay. okay. We know the answer is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we know the answer. So, well, thank you so much. Uh, so, this uh, concludes the, this symposium. And thank you for all the panelists and uh, the, all the SPF yeah. and the, the virtual. And, Actually, um, this session will be available as a part of the IGCS On Demand program following this meeting. And I really appreciate the CGEN people and the GOG partners for uh, well scheduling this very, very important and interesting wow. session. Thank you so much. Distinguished professor. Thank you. Thank you.